Oh, I'm really excited to introduce our, um, our keynote speaker for lunch. Uh, Kyle Woody is the founder and executive director of Jack's Caregiver Coalition, and he will be presenting his story and how he has provided hospitality and served the caregiver community. So join me in welcoming Kyle. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Thank you. I actually get that quite a bit. Are you Jack? You know, and, and I think, well, it'd be kind of weird to name a nonprofit after yourself, but I'm sure some people have done that. So I'm Kyle, and I'm excited to be here today to share with you my own caregiving journey, to share with you the journey of the organization that some friends and I founded called Jacks. And then at the end, what I really want to do is, is open up the floor to all of you and, and take a peek into your journeys. Uh, you'll recall in the registration, you were asked to kind of look back on, on some challenges that you faced, and then to look forward and, and to share with us the, the, challenge that's, the challenges that you anticipate as you move forward. So hopefully that, that'll be the audience participation moment um, there at the end. So I hope to really, really learn a lot about your situations. And I want to say thank you to the newly diagnosed table, uh, Dan and some friends and I over there. I don't know a whole heck of a lot about Parkinson's, but in the last uh, five, ten minutes, I've learned a lot. And um, one of the coolest things is this boxing thing that I'm really excited about um, doing myself um, soon. All right, so my own journey. And in 2011, on the eve of Thanksgiving, my spouse, Sarah, at the age of 33, was diagnosed with metastatic stage 4 colon cancer. And so this picture is taken uh, right after her first surgery, um, about, a, about a month after, because you can see the Christmas tree there. And <clears throat> there we are with our two little boys, Lachlan and Merrick. And about a year later, we had some friends who said, hey, we want to come visit you guys and hang out with you for a week at your home. And they were friends from California. And at the time, we were living in Virginia Beach, Virginia. And they were teachers. They had the whole summer off. And so I was really excited about sharing with them the, the history in Virginia, the, the American history. We, we have Monticello, where Jefferson hung out. We have Mount Vernon. George Washington's estate, Civil War fields. And so being the, the uh, planner that I am, I created a very rigorous agenda and itinerary for them for the entire week. And I was very proud to present it to them at the dinner table that night. And the response was, that's nice, Kyle. <laughs> very nice. But we are here to serve you. And they were looking at me. Wow. And I'm like, okay. Number one, I didn't really say anything. But what I was thinking was, what the hell are they talking about? Um, I'm not sick. She's the one who's sick. And basic confusion, right? And so they went on to explain, well, we talked to our friend and he, he had lost his loved one to cancer. His name was? Jack. Yeah. And Jack said, and they, so they said, we're, we're going to visit our friends. Our fam their family's going through a cancer crisis. Jack had lost his loved one to cancer. And so they wanted advice from Jack. You know, what, what do we do for this family? What's the best thing we could do for this family? And do you know what Jack said? He said, serve the caregiver. I didn't know what a caregiver was, <laughs> right? I didn't know I was one. I was just doing the thing. And so I really enjoy this quote. This was, this was certainly a time in my life where this bear, cancer in my case, Parkinson's in, in your all's case, had chased me up a tree. Um, so, 
I was inspired. It takes us a while, us guys, for things to process. But about three years later, it sunk in. And I said, you know what? I want to pay this forward. And I found other caregivers to serve. And then a little while later, that sunk in. And we said, hey, we got to do something about this. Um, the community out there for men, um, and in our situation, there's a big opportunity. Uh, we, take our, we take our spouse and our loved ones, our kids, to camps and to places, but they're largely uh, run by women. They're largely attended by women. Um, it's not missed on me that most of the people here are women. Um, and so we wanted to create something very different that, that men would respond to. And so the problem that we are solving as an organization is that 78% of men who are caregivers report having no help. So wrap your head around that. And then, and then just think about what are, the, what are the consequences of that. And so... I, while I would love to put a picture up here of the Vikings <laughs> or the wild um, or the Timberwolves, I, I chose the All Blacks. They're a rugby team from New Zealand, and by virtually every measure, they are the best rugby team on earth. And if you ever get a chance to, to do some reading about them and their history, it's fascinating. I love to hold them up. But this guy right here, he is the leader of this team. And if you want to watch some cool stuff, watch them do the haka on YouTube. It's unbelievable. Um, and and that is, that's, that's what I love to point people to as our vision for how bold and confident <laughs> caregivers can be in this team sport. We talk a lot about it being a team sport, but exactly what does it look like when it's done well? Um, and, and how does it feel? And I believe it feels like, like when these guys play. And when you're the opponent facing this team, trust me, <laughs> you are intimidated. Um, and, and so whether you're playing the game against cancer or Parkinson's or Alzheimer's, I think largely the fundamentals of it are the same. So our mission is to improve the way men think, the way they feel, and the way that they act in their role as a cancer caregiver. So that's where we're at now, and, and our vision is bigger than that. It's, it's for all men who are caregivers, for anyone with a malady. But our strategy is, hey, let's master cancer, and then we can grow to other disease communities. But for now, we serve the cancer community. What do we do? Our hospitality brings them together, and together they get better, which is exactly what's happening here, right? Just being at the table with the newly diagnosed and hearing, sharing the lessons learned, um, that's exactly what's going on here, and it's awesome, and I'm glad to see it. So now, exactly what do we do? Um, I feel a little bit odd using this word in a church. Um, <laughs> But maybe it's like the mule. It's a mule, right? Um, acts like a bad mule. Um, so we, what we like to say about our, our programming is we try to make men a little wiser, a little more intriguing, and maybe even harder to kill. And that's what gets them to come, right? Because if we say, hey, you're a caregiver, you need to talk about your feelings. You know, let's go hang out in a church basement and in a circle of chairs, you know. Yeah, they'll just come out of the woodwork for that. Um, so, so we go acts like a badass. Um, mini golf throwdown. You can actually get guys to sit in a circle. You just might need to be on a Ferris wheel at Betty Dangers, which I thought would be weird, and it turns out it wasn't weird at all. It was a ton of fun. Um, meet the workshop. So we hired a professor at the U who has a PhD in meat. Did you know that was a thing? Yeah, me neither. 
dude talked to us about meat for two hours, and it was endlessly interesting. And then we go to have a beer at Surly with everybody, and guess what nobody talked about? Meat. It never came up. I'm like, surely these guys are going to want to like, well, he said peel the little f layer off the back of the ribs and all the stuff he taught us. Not, it never came up. It was, hey, what's your deal? You know, why are you here? Who are you, who are you caring for? What are your challenges? Extreme sandbox. We take large hydraulic machines and smash things. And if you think grown men are not still children, put them at the, on, the, on, the wheel, on the controls of one of these machines and you will see <laughs> something very childish take place. Um, but also very therapeutic. Um, we made that car uh, into oblivion. Uh, Paisley Park. We just take them to Paisley Park. And I'm pretty sure, you know, like Prince, there's probably a lot of stuff that Prince wouldn't have signed off on right after when he died, but I'm guessing he would have signed off on this if he would have known. And then we have another event in January, but one I'm most excited about and the one our legal team is least excited about <laughs> is Vince Lombardi Trophy Chainsaw carving. We're going to carve these things with chainsaws, um, which I just cannot wait. I literally cannot wait. Um, so what do we tell our guys? You know, we, when, we're, when we're asked, the leaders of our organization and those that have been at this the longest, um, who have the most experience, um, I really wanted to just distill it down to three key points that I would like to share with you. And number one is fully appreciate your caregiving role. So in my own experience, I didn't even know I was doing the thing. It's so cool to see a summit full of caregivers because obviously that's the name of the summit. So everybody here at least knows they're doing the thing. Um, but you'd be shocked how many guys are out there. They, they see our website and that's the first time that they are aware that they are a caregiver, that they're doing a thing that matters, right? Um, I tell the story, my spouse would get chemo on a Wednesday, and she would basically be unconscious through till Saturday or Sunday. And she was down to 100 pounds, and Sarah helped me realize this later. She was asleep that whole time. I was wide awake. I was seeing it all. I could see her, her bones and her back like Auschwitz. Um, these are psychological things burned into your brain. Um, and that's the funny thing about uh, uh, psychological pain is that your brain doesn't really know the difference between psychological and physical pain. So while, while your, your loved one might be experiencing the psychological effects of the disease, I would argue you are very much experiencing the psychological effects. Um, so just fully appreciate the gravity of what you're doing. It's not just taking them to the doctor. It's not just getting food or asking for help. It's so much bigger than that. Um, number two, let go of social norms. So at least in the cancer world, I don't know as much about Parkinson's, but I'm sure it's the same. When, when you enter this world, you kind of feel like an alien all of a sudden. Like people at work, people at church, everybody, hey, you know, have a nice weekend. Doesn't that just feel wrong? <laughs> it probably feels wrong for them to say it. But that's, that's the world that we live in, these social norms. We have these conversations that just have a nice weekend. Hey, nice to see you, blah, 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 blah. Well, it doesn't make sense anymore. And so what I tell guys is let go of that. Just call it awkward and move on. Say, hey, I don't know what to say. This is messed up. And that, that uncomfortableness, get used to it, you know, and just move on. We're, I see so many spend far too long trying to pretend that they're not aliens, that they're not on this new planet, then they're just trying to fit in and make that, all that stuff work. And I, and I just think that's wasted time. Call it awkward and move on. And the last one, and probably the most important, 
is become more of a leader and less of a doer. So I'm certain it's been talked about here today. Ask for help. You know, build a team. All these things. This is another way of saying that. But leadership is hard. Asking for help is hard. Being, so in my career, I, I coached men who were, who were construction superintendents, big, big complex projects. And I would see it time and time again. When the pressure builds, the stress, when the deadline is coming, they would retreat and isolate. And so their eight and 10 hour days would turn into 12. And then they would turn into 14 and then 15. Then they start bringing the work home. But they're going to get it done. They're going to grind through it themselves without asking for help, without building a team. And so I was at work teaching people, hey, this is what leadership looks like. This is, this is how you solve big, complicated problems. And then I would go home to my loved one and be a total hypocrite. I would want to be the magic myself. I didn't ask anyone for help. I was taking the kids to preschool. I was driving to chemo to hang out with her, you know, doing it all. And so even for me, knowing all this stuff, I had the knowledge, but I didn't have the wisdom to actually make it a reality. So leadership is hard. It's a journey. Um, but the more that you do yourself, I would argue you're robbing others on your team of those opportunities and that that isn't the best thing for your loved one. Oftentimes. All right. So with that, <clears throat> I, didn't, I didn't want that to sound dep as depressing as it did. Um, looking back. So on the left here, we have some themes that we saw in the surveys. And then on the right, we have some actual, uh, um, this is, correct me if I'm wrong, Aaron, but actually what was written into the form um, quotes. So I'll just go over them and then what I'd like to do is anyone in the audience who's like, hey, that was mine or, or I'm willing to say, hey, let's start a conversation about that. Let's do it. So we have patience was a theme, uh, staying positive. You will get through this together. Educating yourself as a caretaker. Staying optimistic. I love that one. And then seek out support, whether support groups or network for both of you early. That's awesome. Do it early. And then I won't read those to you, but you can, you can read those, uh, the quotes there. To any of those that anyone would love to just say, hey, let's, let's talk about this. I'd love to help you wrestle with it. Um, I know there's others in the room. Yes, sir. Jose. Yeah. Patience. Uh, for how long? Patience. <laughs> for how long? Jose's a very patient man, <laughs> but he would like answers now. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, so that's, a, that's the theme, right? I think that the group went through and kind of looked at a lot of responses and said, hey, this was a big theme, like patience. So let's unpack that. What are we talking about when we say patience? We have a... Yeah, we were just talking about that earlier at our table with the members and forgetting things and how to cognizant things and trying to just tell ourselves, you know what, they're doing the best they can. You're like, well, I already told you that, sir. You know, my husband just, the past two days is scheduled. He's like, oh, yeah, I thought that was yesterday. He got, you know, he got appointments mixed up. I said, well, didn't you write it down? I mean, why would he even ask him that? I mean, he's doing the best he can. Is everyone, is everyone able to hear? No. no. I don't know. Maybe in the, if we have a mic, we might want to be kind of passing that around. <clears throat> um, but I'll, I'll do a horrible job at recapping that. Basically, the, the patience with uh, the uh, cognitive and, and re having to remind folks, like, hey, didn't you write that down? And, and, um, and so what I think I'm hearing is that it, it, to me, it's almost kind of like resilience in a sense in that we know these things, it's going to be kind of, we have to learn to live with it, so to speak. Like you can't just fix that, right? There's no easy button. And, um, and if, I'm, if I'm getting this wrong, please tell me. 
Um, but I think a lot about resilience, just in the sense that, especially with chronic conditions as Parkinson's is, and, and cancer is very much becoming for a lot of people, it's just the new, the way that it is. And, and you, <laughs> you have to learn that, that in, in some cases, that you, I would almost say you have to choose to accept it and, and maybe grieve what, what you had, what you've lost, but grieve and then move on. Um, other, uh, anything, we can stick with patients or we can move on to another theme or comment? Well, I'm not necessarily a patient person and, um, <laughs> uh, and, and tend to anxiety when I have a lot of things I have to do. So um, what I try to remind myself is this whole thing is a process. And um, I'm better now than I was two years ago, but I can still, you know, I told you that yesterday, or I've told you that three times. And then I kind of have to, for, well, forgive myself, I guess, and, you know, try, try to put myself in his position. Um, and I, I remember once I got angry about something, and he said, well, how do you think I feel? And, you know, I'm better now. I'm more patient now. And I'm trying to think of it, the whole journey is a learning experience. And maybe I can learn to be more patient. I mean, that, that would be good for me, too. Yeah, I, I would agree. I would, I would also argue that there is, a, there is a line you don't want to cross, which is not respecting your own boundaries, your own values. And I see this a lot in caregivers where it's always just... You know, the, I, the care getter, I call them sometimes, um, will throw things, kind of those, those, those things out there, like, how do you think I feel? Or, and, and, you know, I think it's a responsibility that the, care, or the caregivers have to, to bring their best to that game to say, hey, we had to talk about this. Like, this is, this is causing me problems. And guess what? We have Parkinson's. Right? It's, it's not just you. This is affecting us both. And so how do we together work through these, some of these challenges? Um, so, and pronoun use, so important. I don't know if that's come up in this conference yet, but um, I love that idea that, that we have cancer or we have Parkinson's because you, and you can list, you listen for that pronoun use that people use, and it'll tell you a lot about how they identify with the situation, whether it's someone else's problem or whether they, they are a part of the solution. Um, I think that's helpful. Other comments on looking back? Observations. Uh, um, yes. Um, I use my loud voice. Oh, we can hear. She just turned you on. Oh, she turned me on. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> I'm back. Um, so you talked about the, the idea that, you know, guys don't like to sit around in a circle. Yeah. And so we, we look up there at a suggestion about seeking support, whether support groups or network for both early on. But, you know, how can you speak to the idea that some people just don't do support groups and what are tools yeah. I mean, can you talk about that a little bit Yeah, more? so support group, uh, or just the word support, is actually a four-letter word for a man. And so don't use it. Like, that's my suggestion. <laughs> if you're trying to reach the, most often when I speak, it's about, it's about men and caregiving, um, which I'm certain there are plenty that, uh, that are just not here um, in the Parkinson's community. Uh, but all of you that are here, kudos to you. Uh, John and, and Jose, but I want to respond quickly to that. With, with, uh, so our strategy is we are doers. We like to do things with our bodies, and it starts when we're very young. Like my six-year-old son doesn't actually even walk anywhere. He flies. <laughs> and and it, I don't think as, as adults, grown men, that changes a whole lot. So when, when we have a guy reach out and I say, let's go hiking, the Lebanon Hills. We're just going to hike. And we can talk or not. 
Um, we did a fishing outing. Um, there, was, there was times on that boat on Lake Minnetonka, 20, 30 minutes at a time, no one said anything at all. And it was awesome. There's nothing wrong with that, I believe. Uh, for men, a lot of times, bonding and support looks very different than it does for women. And just because we aren't saying anything doesn't mean we're not connecting in different ways. Um, so when it comes to, to men specifically, and I would argue there's probably plenty of women that are the same way, uh, that would love to just sit on a boat and not talk for 20 or 30 minutes. Um, and it was cool that the boat, we were literally in the same boat. <laughs> like we always talked about our, we're trying to get together people that are in the same boat, and then here we were. We were all in the same boat. <clears throat> but did I answer, did I answer a question? Yes. yes, sir. Jose, another. Yeah, I, I don't mean to hog this thing, but the, uh, you know, in, instead of calling it a support group for men, Maybe you will want to say something like, when the duct tape stops working. The, the, when the duct tape stops working. Stops working, I like yeah. When, yeah. When it doesn't work anymore. I, <laughs> we got to hire this guy for our website. Uh, the, the, <laughs> yeah. The one thing I would like to, uh, to bring up is uh, uh, finding support or seeking support. And uh, what I'm finding out with, with my wife particularly, she has many friends and all of them want to help at the same time, and all of them that want to come and visit and so forth. And uh, what I had to explain to a couple of them is this is not the kind of help that we need is, is not the hot dish kind of support yeah. any longer. Yeah. What we need is uh, the kind of support that is going to be joined in on the journey. And uh, it's, it's a very different kind of support is not, I mean, we had about half a dozen hot dishes in the refrigerator, yep. but I eventually know. we ate them and there is nothing left. So now is, okay, the, the journey is still going. So what's happening here? Yeah. And that is, a, that is a difficult frame of reference. We hear that a lot. And so my challenge to you and to all of you is that if you are leaders, when your followers say, hey, I want to help. Don't just say the ambiguous stuff. You know, don't leave it out there for them to figure out because otherwise you'll get a hot dish or whatever they can do. Um, but if you are if you are truly the quarterback of your team, if you are the coach of this of this team, guess who designs the plays? It's it's the coach, right? The leader. So you have to come up. We've had guys talk about they, they would, um, they, he told a friend of his, hey, just check in on me once a week. Just call me and ask me what I need. That's what I need you to do. That's your job. Because I might be in a situation where I need you to run to the grocery store, right? Um, so, and, and largely just don't, don't I, I recommend not looking to other places to tell you these things that you should do. Look at your own problems that you're trying to solve, define them, and then build your team to help you solve them. But the, your team works for you. That's, that's another thing. I say, yeah, we could say it's the care-getter. Care um, ultimately, that's, that's the goal. But I, I put it in terms of, look, you're, you're working for me and, and, and my family. All right. <clears throat> Looking ahead, so the themes on the left, progression, um, the disease, helping their loved ones with the daily task and dependence on others, finances, that's a big one, um, cognition and depression, you know, they, like these, in these themes there's a lot of stuff to unpack there. Um, if any of those really resonate with somebody that they'd like to explore, please speak up. Okay, here's, I'm just gonna zero in on this. Um, figure out how to deal with the loneliness. Is anyone experiencing loneliness? 
I think there's an epidemic of loneliness. And I, my theory is it's connected to Facebook and all that other stuff. Um, that we're somehow we're all connected, but yet we never hang out. Um, but what do we do with that? And, and is, a, is that feeling of loneliness or isolation, being isolated? Like I said earlier, what I saw in the men who are experiencing stress is retreat and isolate, like hunker down. And how much do you learn when you're doing that, like from others? You're just going to count on yourself. Um, because what I'm seeing in that quote is this person has resigned themselves that they're going to be lonely, and that's just the way that it is. Figure out how to deal with it. My, my take on that is don't deal with it. <laughs> Find a way out of that situation, be it through your church, um, through friends. Um, you're here with all these people. So we talk about cancer caregivers being aliens and we're all just on this planet, and, it, and eventually we figure that out, and we got to seek out our fellow aliens and hang out with them. Um, connect with the people here. Get their information. Talk to them. Go get coffee once a month. You'd be shocked how, how, how much that'll help you. Justin and I, when we started Jax, that's, that's the way that it started. Lucky 13's in Bloomington. Once a month, we would grab a beer, and that was it. It's not complicated. But immediately that loneliness started to go away that I didn't even really know I was experiencing. I was just getting through it. So I kind of dominated that just because no one was talking. Um, but happy to open it up to anyone else. Any other challenges just... Is there something you're really just wrestling with right now? You're having this conversation in your head. You're worried about a challenge that you're facing. Oh, yes, sir. I'd like to, uh, I'd like to say one thing. Uh, my wife has kind of a double burden. Uh, she has uh, Parkinson's, and she deals with it uh, exceptionally well. We lost our daughter. Uh, we lost our daughter two years ago with brain cancer. Oh, I'm sorry. We spent uh, uh, two wonderful years with our daughter. But uh, my wife uh, has friends and they're two friends that have been since childhood, but she doesn't confide, confide, and I'll see her at night crying, you know? I'm dealing with it. I, it's taken me two years, and I, I think of the good things now. My daughter was my best friend. Yeah. But I worry about my wife. Uh, Last night, I, uh, I, we have separate bedrooms now because she, she strikes out a little bit, uh, not, not through her, her fault, but I go to my bedroom to get into my bed, and my bed is made. I was shocked. I couldn't believe she did it, you know? Yeah. Just a good woman. You know, but I wish there was something I could, you know, I could just fix fix your problem, but I can't fix it. Yeah, you know? and, and grief and um, the, the, the long impacts of, of those things. Um, you know, I, I think everyone in the room is hurting for you. Go through that. Um, but what I want to say to you is, so Jax serves men who were cancer caregivers too. So you are a client of Jax. Um, you're welcome to our events to help teach, teach others um, and, and to help them avoid that loneliness. Coach them and mentor them about the things that you've learned. Um, and we are out of time. Uh, and I know I'm going to get cut off, so I'm just going to leave it. And I hope you all have a wonderful time. And you can follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook.
Facebook, all that stuff that makes us lonely. Um, <laughs> you can. <laughs> we do, yes. You can sign. You can sign up on our website for our newsletter. Is is that what you mean? Like a newsletter? Yeah, some people might want, uh, yep. And I have cards too. I can I can hand out. Um, but yes, follow us. Oh. Oh no, I totally forgot about my last slide. It's one of my favorites. It'll be fast. I, I took a, a quote from Dr. Martin Luther King and I, and I changed it, but I think he would approve. <laughs> if a man is called to be a caregiver, he should give care even as Michelangelo painted or Beethoven composed music or Shakespeare wrote poetry. He should give care so well that all the heaven and earth We'll pause to say, here lived a great caregiver who did his job well. Thank you.